Hello, Elizabeth. Good, good evening for you. Good morning for me. Um, we're 12 hours apart now. Um, we used to live on the same island. It's such a pleasure to finally reconnect after um, a few years now. And um, welcome to this, this series, which is called Voices of the Regeneration. And I feel that your work has been a real bedrock for this new way of thinking about us as one species in life's evolutionary journey, life as a planetary process, creating conditions conducive to life. You've, you've been a voice um, initially not listened to by the mainstream and, and I think um, increasingly people will find your work as, as really foundational to what is now emerging as a response to um, humanity waking up to the fact that we can't go on like we currently are steering our way towards towards climate cataclysm and um, more disharmony in our species R right at that point where we need to come together as one species and understand that we need to take care of our mother this planet um, otherwise we might not have a future and our mother will go on without us so so wonderful to be back in touch with you and I normally start this series by inviting people to Tell a little bit about their own story, how they get into this, got into this work. And um, you're now over 80, so this is a, a long life you're looking back, back, back towards. What got you into studying biology and what triggered you to, to some extent, leave the path of a conventional scientist within the academic institutions and, and find your own path that also took you to the relationship between biology and design. You pioneered a lot of things that other people are famous for. So um, I'd be, yeah, over to you. Tell, tell us a little bit about your story. Thank you so much, Daniel. And aloha mai kako uh, from Hawaii, everyone. That means uh, loving greetings to you all. <laughs> uh, aloha mai kako, the people. <laughs> um, Yes, I grew up in the Hudson Valley, the Hudson River Valley in New York State in the United States, which the indigenous people call uh, part of North America, Turtle Island. In fact, North and South America are the Turtle Islands. <laughs> and um, anyway, I was allowed to run free in nature as a small child and only coming back, you know, at the end of the day for supper kind of thing. And so I, I was uh, total friends with all the little creatures uh, of the forest and, and on the river banks. I say I have the mud of the Hudson River still between my toes. And uh, this got me very interested in nature as a whole. And my mother really promoted that love of nature and gardening. She did a lot of gardening and growing vegetables. And it was also a time still in the Great Depression when everyone in my culture was feeding each other on organic food that they grew on their own farms. And so everything about my life was very, very closely tied to nature. And so uh, I wanted to, as I, as I grew up to, I guess in seventh grade, I was thrilled to have a biology course and I realized that, that studying biology would, would help me really understand who are we humans, where did we come from, when we are going, where are we headed, not knowing those were the great philosophical questions of the ages, uh, I was asking them already as a child. And in seventh grade, I was, I was very young. I was only about 10 or 11 years old, I think, as I skipped a few grades in school. And uh, so I, I had a wonderful biology teacher. And then my parents said, but science is for boys, not for girls. And you have art talent. So they made me go to an art school first. Uh, but eventually I got myself into the study of science and learned the traditional Darwinian version of evolution biology. And then that became too tight a suit for me. I went all the way through to a PhD and then did a postdoctoral fellowship at the Museum of Natural History in New York, uh, studying brain evolution. And, uh, and, and I just began to feel that the whole Darwinian suit was too tight for me somehow. It couldn't explain, my experience of nature myself was so far different from that competitive doggy dog world that I was taught in Darwinian biology. And I actually left science, I gave it up 
and I, I went into esoteric studies. I studied Gurdjieff and Madame, Madame Blavatsky and Findhorn and everything I could lay my hands on for a broader worldview, something expansion, uh, ex expanding my worldview. And eventually I, I went off to the Greek islands to live, deciding I was going to write novels to explain the human condition to myself. And then one day in the, in the woods on my little island, a walking stick fell on my arm, a, a stick insect with long legs looking like a little walking twig. And I burst into tears because I hadn't seen one since I was a child. And I said, I still want to explain nature. I still want to be an evolution biologist. And so I kind of started over and I, I had taken with me some of the newest books by Fritz of Capra and Marilyn Ferguson and uh, uh, well, Eric Jansch, the, the living universe, the self-organizing universe, and I just devoured those books. And I had no access to libraries, but by writing to scientists, I got answers by mail, and they sent me more books and articles. I eventually met uh, Jim Lovelock and, and Lynn Margulis uh, as I was taken from my Greek island up to Cornwall, England for a series of Gaia conferences. And so it went. That's the story, basically. Ah, so you were, you were part of those um, Gaia conferences that I think um, Eddie, Teddy Goldsmith, Teddy Goldsmith funded um, and uh, David Abram was there and, and Stefan yep. Harding and yeah, one, yep. wonderful series of symposia. I've read some of the proceedings. Right. Yeah. It, it really resonates strongly with me. For me, it was less so the, the Darwinian trigger, although that was definitely there for me too, um, or the, the misunderstood Darwinism that, that, that was taught in biology when, when I was a um, at university studying biology, but also the extreme focus on only what is quantifiable and measurable in the convertible into mathematics and statistics that drove me crazy when I was a biologist. I was studying marine um, mammals, um, whales and dolphins and, and elephant seals um, off the coast of California. And so much of the magic just couldn't be expressed in uh, p-values of statistical significance and, and, and that, that's what took me briefly away from science and then I also did a U-turn back. So you, you've pretty much developed a expansion or a, a, um, an alternative view to how evolution functions on, on Earth. Um, looking at both the, the Western and the Eastern science, you, you realize that um, there seem to be clear phases in evolution. I would, I would love for you to, to explain that a little more in detail. Yes, well, I, I was back in the 70s before I went to Greece. I was very interested in paraphysics, in new cosmologies, uh, things of that kind. Through looking at the esoteric world, I got into that, what was called paraphysics. Mm -hmm. and, and realizing that in the Western scientific worldview, uh, we start with the Big Bang, and we have a, a purely material universe, only matter and energy, because those are measurable, as you said, mm. uh, are included in reality. And, and this whole uh, big enterprise, this, this big bang was, was like a battery that was fueling everything, including life, but running down. So the entropy, the running downness of the, of the universe would eventually wipe away even the life that had to struggle up against this eroding entropic tide. And then I, I found uh, uh, people like Teddy Goldsmith writing a wonderful uh, article uh, showing that the earth showed no signs of entropy, except perhaps what humans were doing to nature. <laughs> <laughs> but on its own nature did what didn't show over four billion years of evolution, no sign of entropy. Let and me, oh, me, in looking through the Easter garden. Just briefly come in on that one because that's something that I've been thinking of a lot to to reconcile um what we observe on planet Earth and the the, the clear syntrophic or negentrophic um role that life plays on planet Earth yes. with the second law of thermodynamics and physics. Um, because I also think that they probably have a point there. It's not, it's not, uh, I, I wouldn't say that the second law of thermodynamics doesn't hold. But what I've realized is that we, there's one simple mistake that explains why 
those seem to be at loggerheads, which is that the timescales of physics are just so much more vast than the timescales of evolution of life it's, on it's one more, It's more fundamental than that. Uh, you see, the, the four basic principles or, or the pillars of the, of the Western physics worldview. Uh, uh, what is it? Um, the strong and weak nuclear forces and radiation, uh, and is it radiation, gravity, strong and weak nuclear forces? Mm -hmm. Okay. Three of those four uh, are really about gravity, and gravity is the least understood of those forces. You see, the whole entropic universe is based on looking through telescopes, through light telescopes, where you see an expanding universe. You cannot see the gravitational shrinking of the universe. But there were early people in the 70s, like Ben Bentoff's book, Stalking the Wild Pendulum. Have you ever seen that? He was the first one to show a donut model of the universe. And of course, before Einstein, the British had, had actually sat in their leather armchairs blowing smoke rings and talking about the smoke ring universe because the toroidal form, the donut form, was the only shape that could hold its own in space, right? And it revolved this way around and also kept turning itself inside out. And Bentoff had a cartoon where you stand on the donut looking down into the hole and you say, oh, my universe started at this tiny thing and it's been expanding ever since because you don't notice that on the other side of the donut, it's contracting inward with gravity in order to radiate outward <laughs> again, right? So the Taoists have the most beautiful fundamental symbol of the two forces spiraling around each other, right? The yin yang symbol. When you look at that, you know that they understood a universe in balance. The Western theory of the Big Bang universe is a linear model. It's not an, a balanced model at all. And I think it's because they couldn't understand gravity. And I have pondered a lot about why they have such trouble. They're now talking about that, that gravity may come from uh, parallel universes or something. If they just bring it into our own universe, they've got it, right? <laughs> then you have the whole thing in balance and showing that nothing deteriorates. There's a constant recycling. But now the biologists, of course, had to fit themselves into the, the standard model of physics because physics had been designated the leading science and the rest were all subsidiary. So biology had to show how this struggle for life can happen against the wash away tide. And so the Darwinian theory was very much slanted toward this endless competition and scarcity. But if you looked at nature, you saw so much cooperation going all the all everywhere, including our own bodies with what 50 trillion cells that work in concert with each other. Our Most body not even could human. function if those cells were fighting each other. When that happens, we're sick, right? Uh, so everything you look at, once you you get over the prejudice of, of only Darwinian theory, you see the balance. And indeed, I noticed that the Russians were teaching evolution biology through Kropotkin's book, it's Mutual like Aid, which was the cooperative side. And then both the East and the West politicized this so that the Soviets were asking people to sacrifice their individuality for community and the capitalists were sacrificing community for the individual. And it was very frustrating because if they only put the two together, like putting gravitation and radiation together, they'd have a complete view. What, what do you think, what do you, because, um, well, you're a member of the evolutionary leader circle and, and actually were one of the people who um, supported me in, in um, being invited into that circle. Um, I recently talked to David Sloan Wilson, and um, he very much is walking that tightrope of, of being a respectable academic in the, the current system, trying to lean himself out of the window as far as he can within the orthodoxy of, of the environment that, that he, he works in. Um, but what he's trying to do is to, to rescue um, out of a misunderstood Darwinism and, and a much broader view of Darwinian selection, the um, variation 
selection and um, replication as the basis of the Darwinian process. And, and then with this idea that he developed with E.O. Wilson of multi-level selection, he's actually bringing in that there are layers of competitive behavior and at the group level, um, and the group level goes up all the way to the large group of the planetary process, there's actually a selection towards cooperation and, and, and pro-social behavior, as he calls it. Um, do you think he's on, on, on a track there or what's your view? Oh, sure, yes, and, and, and he does it very cleverly because he, he preserves the Darwinian struggle of the individual against individual until you have a group. But the way you get a functioning group is when the individuals stop fighting each other and cooperate, right? So the, the first instance of moving from cooperation to, uh, from competition to cooperation was when the ancient bacteria who ruled the earth for uh, half of evolution, two out of four billion years of living evolution, only bacteria, and very competitive and feisty in many ways. And eventually they got together and formed the cooperative we know as the nucleated cell, where the different kinds of bacteria that were incorporated gave up some of their own DNA to a central library we call the nucleus and kept just enough as in the mitochondria, you know, to keep functioning within that community but basically gave up their freedom to be in the community. And then because that cell was new on the planet, it had to go through its own, what I call youthful phase, again, being feisty and very inventive in the competitive phase. And eventually another billion years go by and they form multi-celled creatures as their cooperative. So these are the two big leaps so far in evolution. Then you can fast forward to humans because we are multi-celled creatures and we learned in school, you know, the life comes out of the sea and the dinosaurs and the flowers and all of those things uh, we learned in school. That, that, one, that one fourth of evolution was what has been taught to people in, in Western science as evolution. The rest, the earlier three quarters evolution was called primeval sludge or something like that. <laughs> but it's definitely the most interesting part. Uh, I mean, almost every protein in the world today was invented in the ancient microbial world. And we are only now learning how much we depend on that microbial world, that without our gut bacteria and our skin bacteria, we cannot stay healthy. And, 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 and we're part of, and the part of, coming. And, and they're <laughs> also part of the mechanisms by which we actually switch on um, and off certain genes and change gene activity and and basically what expresses us in the formation of new cells through yeah, yeah. the interaction with all these gut bacteria, like um, as you were saying earlier, like m most, most of the cells in our body aren't even human. Um, we're, we're walking ecosystems. 10 times as many bacteria as nucleated cells. And but, now we're, we're still, there's a total misunderstanding of the viral world in, in the med whole medical system because the viruses are just as important to us as the bacteria. And every one of our cells, people don't realize this, our cells are bathed in a liquid that's between the cells. And they are, think of them as rivers floating through these densely packed islands. And every cell in your body is spitting out viruses and fragments of viruses, uh, plasmids they're called, like dandruff 24 seven, that constantly every cell is emitting viruses and the, the full-blown viruses have protein coats and have addresses and are sent up river to where they should go. And if the wrong party opens the thing, it can cause problems. Or if there are imbalances, every traditional medical system, again, was about balance, the balance of opposite forces. But Western science doesn't know about balance, not at its most fundamental level, it doesn't know about balance. And so, uh, so we no longer have a, a medical system in which we talk about rebalancing the system, even though everyone in the medical system knows that the only way to deal with things like the new pandemic is to have a strong immune system. And that immune system is run by your bacteria and your bacteria function through a viral network of communications that they invented, I believe. <laughs> and so, that, that's why we need to get our hands back into the soil because that's how we get in contact with beneficial bacteria that, that improve our immune system. 
Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering, have, have you come across the word and uh, the work of um, John, Stewart, John Stewart, a oh, sure. biologist in Austra Australia, yeah. because he has yeah. this one sentence definition of the evolutionary process that I think is very much akin with, with the work that you, um, you, you've been doing, which is um, evolution proceeds by a process of diversification and then subsequent reintegration of that diversity at higher levels of complexity. That's and what I call the formation of community. And, and then comes the important sentence that throughout the course of evolution, that jump to reintegration at higher levels of complexity normally happens through the evolutions of new forms of collaboration. And, and, yes, and, and which is exact, that, yeah. it's exactly what I call the maturation cycle. Mm -hmm. And we understand that same maturation in an individual human. We expect our, our teenagers to be feisty and know-it-all and competitive and, and then to settle down to be cooperative citizens of their community, right? Uh, I mean, I, we're I, familiar with, with the concept of maturation, so I think it speaks to people. I heard you speak um, about this in one context, and you actually, which I thought was beautiful, the, the, the way that you keep bringing the relationship is that there is this jump, but then the, that new entity goes through a juvenile phase again. Exactly. And, and one, the one place you were talking about this with regard to the big... Yes, yeah, it's not or, as simple. Just as briefly, let me finish the sentence briefly. Um, you, you were talking about it in the context of agriculture and then building cities and how the whole era of empires was basically on the one hand there is this super organism the city as a as a kind of um, multi-organismic entity but then the cities as city states building empires went through another competitive phase and now so th th that would give us hope that even um, cities and could, could actually evolve into a much more co collaborative phase um, in the future. Could yes, you, you see, when, when they only talk about always larger group, uh, larger forms of organization, they miss that fact that each new form then has to go through its cycle again. It's like a rebirth when a new entity forms. It's new, it's young, it has to start again. And that's why I think the, the maturation cycle helps us understand exactly what's happening with humanity. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you brought up the, the cities as cells because uh, the way to see how much we behave like the ancient bacterial world is look out of an airplane at a city by night or by day. It looks exactly like a cell on a substrate. You see the nuclear hub where there's the densest uh, uh, system of, of, you know, the, the library <laughs> and, and all of those functions. And then the, the pseudopods reach out into the countryside where the food is brought in from through the pseudopods of the amoeba, if you'd like. And so that's very interesting to see because it shows you right away that a city, unless it has been an infrastructure built overnight in China or the Middle East and then people stuck into it, that is not a natural city. But cities that grew up from villages to towns to cities are exactly like cells growing. And so uh, this tells me that the cities are much more important to our human future than nation states, which are completely arbitrary lines scratched across cultures on maps and, and have no bearing on ecosystems. They have nothing to do with the watersheds of, of uh, what's it called? Uh, Echo uh, bioregionalism. I was right. going to go there next. Uh, yes. yes. Yeah. So nation state boundaries completely ignore bioregionalism, which is about watersheds. It's about the areas from the high places to where the water flows. Make, that makes a watershed, right? There's usually a, a river flowing through mountains, kind of have, thing. Have you, come, have you come across um, the work of a biologist who actually is also? credited for being the founder of the academic disciplines of town planning and sociology, Sir Patrick Geddes. Um, he he Sir wrote Patrick. a book, Sir Patrick Geddes, a Scot. Geddes, Geddes. No, G-E-D-D-E-S. -E -D -E -E okay. Geddes is basically the father of bioregionalism. He, he um, taught biology at Dundee University in, at the turn of the last century from the 1800s to the 1900s mm -hmm. and lived in Edinburgh. Um, the Edinburgh Summer School is part of, of his doings. He, he brought people like Heckel and um, 
basically inter international leading thinkers to Edinburgh to have these symposia in the summer to create a more holistic uh, understanding of, of the world. And Geddes has this thing called the valley section where he, where he shows that cities need to be planned from the mountains to the sea in the context of the river systems that connect the mountains to the sea. And, um, and that, that's where healthy city development really needs to go back to, to be the drivers of a re-regionalization at the bioregional scale, so we can match human activities and the way humans meet their needs back to the biophysical reality of the bioregions and the ecosystems we inhabit. I mean, that's that's absolutely. That's, and yeah. you know, it's another fascinating thing about living uh, on islands <laughs> uh, is that we can see that kind of the rivers flowing out of the mountains. Right? You're on Mallorca, and I'm on, in Hawaii. And the Hawaiians actually did the perfect bioregionalism. Every farm went from the top of the mountain all the way to the ocean, following streams. The streams were the dividing lines between the farms. So every farm was like a, a narrow triangle, and each of them had access to the seafood, to the, to the fields where they grew the taro and, and made fish ponds inland, to up as high as where you got the lumber for building the houses and things like that. So all the farms were equal in that bioregional sense. And, and this is not competitive. This was a natural division, equitable division of, of, uh, of land. And that was, it was called the Ahupua'a system of the Hawaiians. And so when I teach my MBA students, we talk about there, there's a strong movement here to recreate that system, which of course has been completely messed up by paving the water sheds and, <laughs> and doing everything, with the, trying to manage nature in the wrong ways. And I would love for you to, like having, you've now been on Hawaii for what? Um, four, five, five years. years? Five years. Um, because I, I recently, through work that I've been doing with the Commonwealth Secretariat on, on um, initiating a kind of slow process of introducing regenerative development to the policy maker, makers of the 54 nations of, of the Commonwealth, we had a gathering uh, at the Commonwealth Secretariat last uh, October, and I met the delegation that came from New Zealand, which is, was largely a Maori um, delegation. And through that, I had this absolute delightful experience of feeling a lot of the scientific theories that I've been collecting and putting together in my own work. Um, and also the, the theories of design, scale linking design, how it's all connected health as an emergent property of um, at different scales of, of the nested complexity we're in and all these kind of concepts, I would offer them to them and they would then echo back from within their own worldview, something that was constantly in alignment. Like, yeah, we're talking about the same thing, but we're talking in different language. Have you have you found that? Um, because it, I'm realizing that the, the wisdom of the Maori is really the wisdom of the Pacific. It's the Polynesian navigators that 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 yeah. built a system that is just so important for us to learn from. I would love for you to speak to that. Yeah, well, I'm in love with the Polynesian navigators too, and and uh, uh, their chief navigator is is a friend, and uh, they sailed around the entire globe two years ago with no compass in in one of these canoes, and the canoes are are never uh, uh, solidly hammered together, nailed or screwed or anything like that. Every part is lashed to every other part so that it can be flexible in a storm on that doesn't break on the waves in a storm. And these Polynesian navigators uh, had umpteen ways of reading nature to know where they are. They understood nature so well, in fact, that they could not be lost. And it wasn't just the stars because sometimes for weeks you can't see the stars, mm -hmm. but you know the wave patterns and the fish patterns and the floating seaweed and the clouds that form over islands. And, and when all else fails, they say, stand tall in your canoe until you can see the land. They say, raise your consciousness up to where you can see, which brings us to a whole other aspect of nature that Western science doesn't understand, <laughs> which is consciousness. But I, I didn't want to get quite there yet, but I want to say that I was a co-founder of uh, something we called the Worldwide Indigenous Science Network. 
And we founded this for two reasons, to learn from Native peoples their sciences and to let young Native people know that their cultures did legitimate sciences uh, way back before Western science was born. And, and they understood all of these things about how to get along in nature. And so it's kind of funny for them to see us white people from the Western worldview come along and, and figure these things out right? <laughs> when they have known them for as long as they've been around. And I want to speak specifically to the concept of democracy here. Uh, there's a very wonderful book by Jack Weatherfield called uh, Indian Givers. And that's, of course, a play on when we say Indian givers, we mean somebody dishonest who is not going to give you fair exchange. But he is saying, oh, but the Western world has learned so much from Indians, and we gave it all freely. And one of the things they gave us was how to do a democracy. Now, the founding fathers of the United States were exactly on the turf of the Haudenosaunee Indian people, Native Americans, who had unified six warring nations under a great law of peace for many centuries that had no more wars and had a completely representative democracy. And, uh, and Benjamin Franklin, one of the founding fathers of the US Constitution, was the only one who bothered to really get to understand their great law of peace and their, way, their political system. And he kept telling his fellows, you've got to copy this, you've got to copy this, this is really good. There was no democracy to copy from. The name came from the ancient Greeks, of course, but as we know, that was a slaveholding society that wasn't exactly democratic. Women were not enfranchised, neither were the slaves. You know. But the Haudenosaunee included everyone, women and children, and seven generations into the future with every deliberation you make now. If a man wanted to propose war, he had to walk into parliament wearing a skirt and carrying a corn grinding bowl to remind people what war would do to the food supply and the women and children. And so they had no more wars. <laughs> uh, these things are completely, you know, we, the only thing that the founding fathers of the U.S. took from them was the balance of powers, the tripartite government in checks and balances against each other but they left out women, children, and the future, and nature, uh, which was so important. And so if we, furthermore, they also uh, put in the vote. And voting is a divisive way of doing a multi-party system. Yes, nature has, has opposites. Nature is profoundly conservative with things that work well and radically creative when things don't work. When they, how to make something work that doesn't work. That should be a friendly collaboration, not a hostility between opposing parties that you vote every year whether to do this one or that one. Yeah. You always have to be conservative and radical, and it must be by agreement. So if we could only have the great law of peace, <laughs> we would have a real democracy, I'm I've, saying, I've, and they I've, figured it out so long ago. <laughs> I've experienced that in, in my apprenticeship and the way of counsel with Gigi Coyle and, and, and others from, from the Ojai Foundation, where um, really the, the way of sitting in council is not, a, you don't come to a final agreement that you then put, put to a vote. You just hear all the voices and all the perspectives to the point that the collective intelligence, the container you formed with the council informs everyone to a point that that even if you don't necessarily have a one sentence, this is what we've decided, everybody is in resonance and understanding of what now needs to be done. So very often, I mean, Gigi even tells the story that in the early councils with, with Western mindset developers and so on, they, they kind of never understood wh where's the decision. Um, but, but all the indigenous people said, well, it's obvious after the council, isn't it? Um, um, but I, I wanted to come back to something that I didn't we, know. By the way, we reflect that in Quaker yeah. meetings. It's yeah. the closest thing. True. Mm. They, they probably learned from that. They, um, but I didn't know you, you created this organization um, of indigenous sciences. But I, what I do know is that you've done a piece of work that I think hasn't got enough attention and that um, is so critical for the future of humanity. And hopefully it will be 
re-edited at a much larger scale. The, the work that you did with this Japanese foundation of initially bringing Eastern and Western science together, and then also running another symposium where you worked with Islamic sciences. And what I love about this approach is that you, from the beginning, say, you're basically appreciating multiple ways of knowing without dismissing any of them. But um, I think you have this wonderful image of, 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 a, of a keyboard. Um, can you tell a little bit more about that story? Yes, yeah, so one thing that, that uh, scientists, uh, physicists all over the world seem to agree on is that the universe is made of vibrations, <laughs> of waves. And so it seemed reasonable to take a keyboard as a, as a, a metaphor uh, for a sequence of frequencies from low to high or high to low, depending which way you look at the keyboard, which end you start from. And when you, when you do that, you actually uh, reflect the Taoist view. I mentioned Taoism before, because they had a matter, energy, spirit sequence. And so I say the low keys are matter, the slow vibrations, it's generally agreed on that that's where matter should reside on the keyboard, not in the high frequencies, but in the low ones. And as you move up the keyboard, you get to electromagnetic energy which was considered non-real in Western science until it could be measured. Before that, it was like a stage show, ma animal magnetism being demonstrated, right? Things like that. And so then that came into Western science and we're up the keyboard as far as what we call zero point energy, that background vibration in the whole universe. And, but we can't get any further because things get less and less material as you go up and in the higher keys, you have mind and spirit and consciousness. Now, the, Easter, the Western ones start from the matter end, as I said, but they get stuck partway up the keyboard because they cannot measure the non-physical vibrations. The Eastern sciences and, and philosophies all started at the other end in a sea of consciousness, basically, and slow the vibrations down to get the rest of the keyboard. So they don't have a problem seeing the entire keyboard. And I often say when people say it's so important now for us to raise our vibrations, don't forget to play in the low keys because the point of raising your vibrations is to expand your keyboard. Mm -hmm. And if you lose the lower vibrations, then you're stuck up there with the angels who are envious of, of human which, bodies. Right? Which, is, which is one of the really big issues in, in the kind of spiritual enlightened circles is that you, you have too few people who have an imminent spirituality and too many who are talking about transcendent spirituality losing themselves in, in kind of belly gazing and 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 yes, losing, the connection losing, with the, yeah. losing the connection with nature and really our our job is to bring cosmic love down to our physical toes not just our minds not just even our hearts but all the way down to our toes we must do this now about the, the different sciences, uh, once I could see that you could get completely opposite uh, statements out of a science that starts at one end or the other. And by the way, the quantum theorists in Western physics bumped into not being able to explain what they were finding with the assumptions of Western science that this is a purely material universe and that you can look at it objectively and that consciousness comes out of matter. Those are all basic axioms of Western science. So they turned to Vedic science from India to explain their own results. Yeah, and I, that Heisenberg, became known, yeah. that was the origin of what we call the paradigm shift, right? That we're still working on. So that's why on my first uh, symposium, which was funded in Japan by this wonderful uh, sponsor, um, Akio, uh, oh gosh, and now I can't think of his name, last name. Um, anyway, he, uh, what we did was invite people with Western PhD, Western science PhDs who had made the paradigm shift so that they understood what the axioms that they were taught were, were and also what the new axioms they adopted from Vedic science were and could compare the two. Mm -hmm. And I was looking for how do we bridge this gap? But then I realized suddenly it was like an epiphany. Why should I not allow both of those and show the world how 
one science can lead you to say consciousness is a late emergent product of material evolution. In other words, matter gives rise to consciousness, while another science with a different set of assumptions says, no, consciousness gives rise to matter. Absolutely opposite views, right? And I used to talk about this uh, a lot with, with leading edge, you know, paradigm shift kinds of science, uh, scientists. Um, and so then I said, well, let's, let's see if we can get another science uh, to write out their axioms, right? And that's how Kuala Lumpur happened for uh, inviting Islamic scientists and philosophers of science. And at first they were completely confused. What was I trying to get them to do to write down what? Their axiom, what were the, <laughs> but eventually they did it. And then we distilled the three sciences into 10 basic uh, statements. So every science has a worldview made up of a set of concepts because you can't study nature as a scientist if you have no idea what is a na what's nature, what's a universe. You must have a, a, a fundamental worldview story about what it is you're studying in order to study it. So you prejudice the case from the beginning, but it's the only way you can possibly have a science, right? You Where can't make you a theory if you don't know what you're making a theory about, right? So that so then we had the three, and then I my the fourth one on my agenda was Taoist science, which I haven't brought into being yet, and then indigenous sciences would be very important to add. And eventually we might end up with a single science globally, but I think we must go through the importance of recognizing diversity. It's part of this whole thing of coming recognizing that racism is holding up everything that when you do not treat everyone in the global family as a beloved equal other human on the planet and see nature the same way. So if we stop making war on each other and on nature and we stop racism, which is almost a prerequisite to stopping war, if we could get those two things out of the way, we'd be a very long way to a better world, climate change or not. Have you have you done like the the work so far? The the, the three sets of axioms have they been written up? Is it like yeah. if people? Yeah, I have them. I have them as a single page. I can send you. That would be wonderful. And is it, is it, is there a website that I can refer people to where you, where they could find um, more? Oh, I I will ha I will post it on my website. I didn't Perfect. think to do that. Yeah. <laughs> and out of the work with Islamic scientists, was it with out of that work that? You also developed this this um, project of looking at what would a new economics based on yes. learning from life's principles or how life right because work. because uh, Western science uh, was the materialist science, mm -hmm. Eastern science was the consciousness based science, and Islamic science, to my surprise, was the science of a living universe. Their number one statement is Allah created the universe. Their number two statement is and he told us to study it, to study the living universe. And I said to them, you know, in order to put yourselves on the map, you have to demonstrate that you can do something Western science has been unable to do. And I can tell you right now that they have no science of economics. Economics is not a science in, in Western. It's, it's it a, pretends to be, but it's, it's um, bad. It problem. pretends to be. Uh, it does not have, it doesn't have the same kind of axioms and, and theorems and proofs, you know, to call it a science. It doesn't study things the same way. But in a living universe with living nature as your primary uh, object of study, they could do one because nature has been doing economics from the get-go. What is an, an economy takes resources, transforms them into goods and services, distributes, consumes, and recycles. We do all of those except the recycling part, right? <laughs> Which is a big, big flaw and why we cannot call ourselves a science of economics. But they could do that. And then I say, don't replace Western science in your university with Islamic science. Teach them side by side so that people can see how different assumptions lead to different sciences and respect them all until we get together strongly enough to maybe be able to do our checks and balances within a single science. So what, what would you say are the lessons that, if, as because now finally, um, I remember, I mean, you were also involved in um, helping to uh, create the guy education curriculum and um, 
the, the initial version of the online course that, that I worked with for many years. Um, and back when we brought out that course in 2007 or eight, it was really quite heretical in terms of the critique of the current growth economics and, and the, the dogma of conventional um, economics. And what I've observed in the last 10, 12 years is that it's become absolutely okay to say that the current economic system is broken and we need to reinvent the economic system. And, and people in very conventional settings are saying that now, even all the way up to the IMF. Um, yeah. And, and there are all these wonderful fora where people are the We All Alliance and, and lots of others where, where people are exploring a, a new economics, the work of Kate Rayworth, um, another donut. Um, uh, what would you say are the key lessons from life, from biology, um, from, from ecosystems mm -hmm. that we need to have in mind when we, when we redesign um, our economic systems? Well, I think it's very, uh, you know, you can't separate politics from economics. And so this, this concept of, of having a, a rule by the people for the people, that's we, that literally is what democracy means in Greek, rule by the people, that the people must recognize that we have to have both conservative, that there's always, you're always seeking balance between extremes, right? And, uh, and the same thing has to go for a health care system. We only have a sickness care system at present, which is unfortunately so profitable that it's very difficult to dent. But it wasn't so long ago that we had an actual health care system. In fact, homeopathy was taught in medical schools across the U.S. not too long ago. There's a statue to Hahnemann in Washington, D.C., four blocks from the White House. Uh, but the Rockefellers made all the medical schools in the country an offer they couldn't refuse. Money, buildings, equipment, everything, if they would go to completely drug-based medicine. So we have to look into our own history. We have to look back into how can we achieve the kind of balance that keeps that where we don't destroy ecosystems so that the wrong viruses leap onto us as lifeboats <laughs> and so that we make peace with the micro world rather than trying to endlessly commit genocide on it, which is an insanity. And so we have to look to, to democracy and to politics and to health care and to education and to all of these things that we want. And as I said before, if we could get rid of racism and warfare, those two things, then I think, and, and establish a real democracy. And I see this happening in the chrysalis of the shutdown at present, that people, first they elevate caregivers to heroism, not military figures, not big scientists, but caregivers, the ambulance drivers and nurses and, and the farmers sharing food with each other as people lose their jobs and the economy goes to pot that we can take care of each other again, as in my childhood. Now I'm in another Great Depression again. And unfortunately, I don't, I'm not surrounded by organic family farms this time, but we must recreate them as you so well know and as you are working so hard to do. So I say, you know, there are many, many, I, I like two Rumi quotes so much. One is, why do you stay in prison when the door is so wide open? And the other is, there are a thousand ways to kneel and kiss the earth. That whether you are an or want to be an organic farmer or, or go out and register voters for an election or fix computers or write songs or whatever makes your heart sing, think of how you can make that contribute to the world that we all want, the peaceful, equitable, flourishing world, the thriving world that we want. And then together, I think we can adapt to this massive climate change and things like that, and that we won't have these pandemics if we have strong immune systems and come back into balance with nature. So it really is doable. I, in, in honesty, I believe our populations will be dramatically reduced by the crises because we have waited too long already. However, Think of yourself and your children and your grandchildren as survivors. They are certainly potential survivors. If we go back to bioregionalism as you are practicing now, Daniel, it is the only way to go. And it's doable. And 
I think the whole cosmos is on our side, wanting us to mature into rebalancing with nature. The indigenous people we have as role models, but they never had to do it at a global scale. That is what is new. That is what we are tasked with. And we have things like the internet now. We can do it. We zoom like crazy these days. And people like Eric Whitaker can, can put ever more thousands of people into the same choir harmonizing each other. You know, these are, these are important things that are tools on our way now. Yeah, I mean, like the, the garden the, too. <laughs> the, the political principle of subsidiarity, of, of really enabling people at um, the community and regional scale to make the decisions that are meaningful to their future and their children and all other forms of government governance being um, subsidiary to that in the sense that yes. they only have coordinating functions and make sure that there's global solidarity in this process. That's yes. really the, the political organization that would enable people to like a lot of pol politicians talk about citizens' participation, but we don't have a system, particularly because of our economic system, that actually enables um, true participation. And, and, and also, I always find that there's a caveat to that, which is if you hand over participation before you also engage in a decolonialization of the mind and, and eco-literacy building, then you, what, what you get back from a participatory democracy is what the junk that we've been putting in um, to people for the last 30, 40 years in terms of worldview and understanding of life. Um, you, 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 mentioned, <laughs> you mentioned the two, two um, Rumi quotes. Uh, you, I yesterday watched a video of, of your TED talk in Marrakesh, and you ended with a wonderful Hafiz um, quote uh, that apparently is a letter that you wrote to, to Goethe. Um, do you still remember it? Um, the Hafiz uh, the, the poem. Never Never yeah. once in all this time has the sun, uh, has the earth, no, wait a minute. Never once in all this time has the sun said to earth, earth, you owe me. Look what happens with a love like that. It lights up the whole sky. <laughs> Wonderful. That's it. I, I know you have a call now, so we probably have to leave Thank it there, so but that's much. a beautiful place to leave it. So nice to read. Oh, how am I, Kako, everyone. Yeah, blessings to, to you. <laughs> Hope Better to see you again soon. <laughs> Thank you. Have a wonderful rest Bye. of the evening. Bye. Thank you, Thank you Daniel. Oops.